our ability to be both kind of reactive to what the industry needs and also proactive to see what else can we bring beyond that. It's a big differentiator for us. Our product team is it's kick ass. We did service, we did service really well. Um, and we would rapidly adopt different technologies from different niches of markets that hadn't been seen in multifamily and bring them in in different packages. That's sort of how we started. And then it slowly transitioned into a more a product centric approach with the service attached. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. I'm Reed. Reed, today we have Grid, uh, G-R-Y-D, on the podcast. Um, yeah, what'd you think? I was intrigued, I guess, uh, when I heard, because often when we talk to business businesses that have kind of service and tech, there's a clear connection. Mm -hmm. Um and this one stumped me for a second. And so it was fun digging into that. Um, I'm not spoiling anything by saying they have this kind of parking app. Um, as they said, Airbnb for parking and multifamily. I'm just trying to keep it super simple. And then they have their digital assets, you know, where they offer this 3D kind of immersive media assets, you know, for mostly lease ups, uh, new construction, renos, things like that. And so just trying to reconcile that um, up front you know, was, was, uh, challenging. Um, but then as we talked through it, it was just kind of fun hearing how they got there. Uh, and that's where we started to see some, I guess, commonalities with, with what we've done with Fiona. And that's always fun. Yeah. I didn't want to hit, I mean, we spent quite a bit of time like talking about either maybe, maybe 40, 60 or something like that. But, um, I, in my head, I was thinking more around the business model, right? Because they have the digital asset thing, which tends to be a large upfront commit. And then, as they said, you may, have some some tack on like hosting or whatever, but they're trying to be really competitive there on price. Mm -hmm. And so then to me, what it they we did not talk about this, but I'm just going to make a leap here and think that the parking aspect is more related to hey, we can get some reoccurring revenue. Mm -hmm. It is a problem that we saw that needs to be solved. Not a lot of folks are solving it, and yet it could also add some reoccurring revenue because he did mention several times, Josh, that they um that they had gone into it to get some ancillary revenue. So when he said that, it's like okay. That's how I made that made the leap to say great ancillary recurring revenue. And it is something that we've heard more and more in recent years that is an issue. I mean, mm -hmm. we've always heard it's an issue. Even back, Elaine Woods had told us how how big of an issue parking was, but that was more about spots being taken. And it sounds like they found a lot of areas where uh, their available parking can be a nice revenue driver and can mm -hmm. be really additive to the property. So um, it's funny because it's I'm sure a lot of these folks, even our friend um, Todd Kettler, Kettler. Mm -hmm. whatever anyone home mm -hmm. like went over and is doing a parking thing now so it's mm -hmm. like it does seem like it's another thing that needs to be solved yeah yeah i wonder if three five years from now that it's still one company um mm -hmm. you know because this in itself this business unit as they were saying could take it into more adjacent business units i'm oh, sure that i'll say continue to get it further away from their roots um versus closer you know yeah. but it could go the other way i mean who knows how it, a lot of it depends on you know how they're approaching product yeah. development i'm i'm gonna take another leap here i think that what is nice about it though meaning like i don't think that would be a bit very hard switch for them to pull off uh, moving parketing to another company because it, it doesn't sound like it's as con it's consumer facing where now you have to get a lot of the brand recognition right it's more he like, said it runs in the background it runs in yeah. the background goes yeah. to these other parking services like cleans up the data blah 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 so it's more the b2b aspect which fine as we've learned you have like one primary contact so it's not hard to update the contacts so, hey we have a new name this is your parking solution totally um it, but there was also something interesting there that i hadn't thought about but he talked several times in his examples about student and how like well during the summer you may have all the units leased but you have no no one's driving mm -hmm. right or even during the mm -hmm. school year depending on the campus they may not need the parking totally. and so um just seems like a really interesting angle into student um, I mean, we've got quite a bit of student, but it's nice in a way that they would have that lead in because, uh, as they said, same buying persona. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else uh, that you find interesting that people should stay tuned for? Well, their nationality, but um, I think you're just going to have to listen to the whole podcast to figure that one out. And leave a comment if you think you can figure it out. Yeah, I think you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool.
All right. Well, this is fun. It's good to learn about grid. Uh, we enjoy Josh and JD. So we hope you guys do too. Okay. Well, we're here with Josh and JD. Josh, let's start with you to introduce yourself. Wait, 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 wait. We're oh. here with Josh and Josh. Josh and Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One of them has, has accepted JD um, and apparently lost a competition with their intern, um, <laughs> who was another Josh, on who's, who's the best Josh or most popular. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you need to expand on that story, but I just want to make sure. We were clear up front. We got <laughs> yeah, there's no room for any additional Joshes. Um, <laughs> thanks, David and Reed. Uh, nice to nice to finally meet you guys, and uh, really uh, excited to be on the podcast today. And uh, it's awesome to see what you guys have done uh, in in the space. Um, I'm Josh Glow, uh, co-founder uh, and uh, president at Grid. I've been here for uh, eight eight plus years. Pass the mic over to you, JD. Thank you. Yeah, uh, JD, I. Go by JD in the office, Josh in real life, day one of joining Grid. Josh Glow basically sat me down and goes, look, you're not Josh anymore. So I get used to it. It was, it was a power move by him and I've respected it ever since. Um, I'm the vice president of sales at Grid. I've been with the company just under five years now, um, basically working primarily in an account setting, work with most major, major uh, companies, and then also oversee the uh, product and product development team. And we, we've known each other for two decades, actually. So uh, known each other for a while, started working together five years ago. So, yeah. Oh, well, we did hit this at the end of the LCP 360 episode, but now you got to give us the details on that. How did you guys first meet 20 years ago, Josh? Good question. Uh, well, I'm friends with your brother, first of all. We went to the same summer camp growing up, went to the same school, high school. <laughs> Just cross yeah. paths everywhere in the community, I guess. I also, if I recall, I, uh, I coached. This was when we were probably 15, 15 years ago. I coached Josh in basketball. He was a terrible player, but he, he just had the mindset. I was like, I believe in this guy. He can do it. So a terrible basketball player, but a uh, hell of a businessman. I'll give him that. He's, he was a hustler. He made sure he got all his fouls in, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. cool. Well, um, I guess, Josh, why don't you give us the, what is grid? What, or actually, let me start with JD since JD, you said sales. Give us the elevator elevator pitch for Grid, and then we'll go over to Josh to give us the history. Okay, sounds good. Uh, Grid, we are we're a prop tech company that essentially deploys and develops um, software and innovative tech solutions for properties at uh, any point of the process, from pre-lease and pre-construction all the way through stabilized. Um, there's two kind of unique divisions to Grid. Grid Digital is where I spend most of my time in Grid Park, where Josh kind of oversees most of his. Um, the Grid Digital aspect, uh, real estate media, 3D visualization design company. So we have a full suite of tools from end to end, as I mentioned, that from pre-lease all the way through stabilized, that will help to accelerate and level up the, the leasing process. And then Josh, did you want to talk about Park a little bit? Yeah, and then we got fascinated with... Um how slow moving the uh, uh, parking assets were in the uh, multifamily space um, and uh, ripe for disruption. So we got really focused on ancillary revenue starting about 2019, 2020, and then uh, double down on the specific parking angle, which I'll talk about, I'm sure tons here. Um, but I can get into the bit of the history too. Um, found in 2016. Um, and yeah, as JD mentioned, we were focused on a lot of traditional media and marketing. You know, it was at a time where, uh, you were lucky if you were a property manager that had a BlackBerry Pearl cell phone photo of the exterior of the building. And that was it. That was your online presence. Um, and, you know, tenants and, you know, potential tenants, consumers, uh, they didn't get much until they came to the in-person in experience. Um, and that's what they were used to. That's what property managers were used to. Um, and so, uh, you know, at the time we we're doing a ton of traditional media and then starting to bring 3D, uh, 3D immersive media, um, and uh, you know, virtual staging and then some additional assets to just really amplify the experience and drive more users, but also at a time where now consumers are expecting more uh, to convert themselves for conversion into the door. So um, that's where we really got started and then started adding a startup within the company that's quite different uh, than Grid Digital. Um, but uh, yeah, we're super pumped about it. So were you in the man property management space before Josh? Like how did you even know this was an issue and then decide I want to take on digital assets? Yeah, great question. Yeah. Before grid, I had a few small companies here and there. And, um, I also did an internship, 
uh, in property management. Uh, you know, at that time, I really fell in love with the space. Um, and the, the main reason why was because I wanted to find ways to uh, improve the space uh, through innovation. Like I saw that, you know, not all, but some property managers were are dinosaurs, um, just massive beasts, lots of capital, um, but weren't adopting technology at the rate of a lot of the other sort of uh, sectors around. And so I became really obsessed with the space and I wanted to be around it, not necessarily in it doing day-to-day property management, but I wanted to find ways to make property management more efficient. Got it. And at the time, uh, who would you have seen as like the, I guess the core competition and then how has that changed now? Like who, who would you now say, you know, I'm, I'm sure others have popped up at this point. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been interesting for sure. So, um, well, when we started off, there wasn't much competition at all. Um, you know, there was a few different providers offering different cameras and 3d technologies and, you know, obviously Matterport was one of the biggest players to emerge. Um, and, um, you know, fast forwarding to closer to today, it's the, the competition curve has completely changed where, you know, many companies and, you know, many individuals just own Matterport cameras on the side. Um, and so because we were narrowly focused at this sort of enterprise level, you know, commercial retail, multifamily residential space, while the majority of the industry seemed to be moving towards uh, purpose built for sales, like, you um, you know, residential sales, working with real estate agents and working in that space. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to watch the landscape and watch some of these acquisitions that happened in the last couple of weeks, which I'm sure we'll chat about. Um, but, uh, yeah. Well, I do eventually want to get to parking, but I, uh, I also wanted to get to what you just brought up. Um, so first of all, how, how then did you differentiate yourselves? Cause Reed and I got into the space probably 2015 was our first exposure and we didn't start digital until 2017. And I, at the time was then familiar with Matterport and LCP 360 because, you know, they, they had worked with Graystar and that was one of our clients at the, uh, in the early days. Um, but I, it, it's funny, like when I entered the space, I just took some of these folks like, oh, you're established and you, you have it all figured out. And I'm just trying to figure out what rent roll means, you know? <laughs> so, um, but <clears throat> obviously, um, since I've learned like, okay, just cause you were here first, it, uh, some of these folks weren't here that much longer than, than when we started. And so they were still figuring it out too. And I'm, and I'm not saying any of that about LCP or Matterport. They've, they both have scaled well. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, just generally speaking like that, like I remember knock, like I was like, oh man, knock is terrific. They've got it all figured out. But then again, I later learned like they weren't that much older than, than us. They just, um, had really good presence at the time. So mm-hmm. anyway, mm-hmm. And a little more money. <laughs> they had more money for sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, anyway, so uh, how did you guys end up differentiating yourselves? Because we, we struggled yeah. with this early on, but I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if you went up against them. Yeah, I think I think it's changed as the companies matured. And we started off with like a really, really good uh, service segment um, and partnership strategy where uh, we had a really unique approach to um, – you know, we did service, we did service really well. Um, and we would rapidly adopt different technologies from different niches of markets that hadn't been seen in multifamily and bring them in in different packages. That's sort of how we started. And then it slowly transitioned into a more uh, product centric approach with the service attached where we have built some proprietary software and tech um, and, uh, and the unique pipelines and workflows on how to keep costs down by ingesting architectural assets for pre-leasing materials, et cetera. Um, so yeah, it's really evolved. Um, and, uh, JD, I don't know if you want to add to any of that, but. Yeah. Like, you know what, there's, there's so many companies within our space and in the 3d space in general, where each has their own sort of unique approach to it, whether it be the software, the tour platform they're using, the hardware, the camera that they're using, for us, where we really try to make an impact and, you know, our position in the market is we still see ourselves, even though we've grown from, you know, five to 30 plus in four or five years that I've been here, we pride ourselves on the white glove service, you know, with Matterport, you have a problem. You're just going to issue a service ticket. You're just another number for us. Every single client knows their project manager, knows their design manager, knows their account lead by name. We're accessible by phone, by email, by text, any point of the day. And that's something that I think we'll never lose. It's kind of gotten us to where we are. And then from a, a product standpoint, you know, we've always looked at, as Josh mentioned, bringing in tech from outside of our space and how can we adapt that to the multifamily space? And we've hit some home runs and we've, we've also had some, some 
pretty big flops. So I would say we'll kind of get into them a little bit, I'm sure, but the our ability to be both kind of reactive to what the industry needs and also proactive to see what else can we bring beyond that, it's a big differentiator for us. Our product team is it's kick ass. Reed, I see like three different angles I want to take, but figure I can toss it to you first and see. There's a decent chance that one of these will overlap, but yeah, yeah. perhaps not. <laughs> I'm I'm still uh, curious about the parking um, and and how that yeah. came to be, and and as you mentioned, some some misses and and some areas you've connected on the product yeah. uh, development. How you guys are approaching that? We've learned up quite a bit, I'll say, just in the last couple of years about what it means to be a product company and and have a product model which I appreciate instead of, you know, hearing the, the common frameworks, um, just more of a model to, and this is the Kagan, if you guys know Marty Kagan, but work within that kind of, uh, those kinds of processes. And I, it leads you into all sorts of different interesting possibilities, right? And that's one of the hardest things for entrepreneurs and those that are starting to find success on the service side as they try to make that transition to perhaps more tech, more product led, um, how they really keep their focus. And, I would love for you to connect, you know, through this, like me teeing you up, but how you got to parking. Um, and do you see much more changing over the next two to three years, or do you think it's still going to be digital or grid digital with the creative assets and parking for the unforeseeable future? Yeah. Great question for us. The business units make sense together. Um, it's the same customer. Uh, it's often pretty closely the same department. Uh, whether marketing and operations, they're sometimes closely tied or can report into each other. Um, yeah, it was a big transition. You know, we're doubling down on um, a whole different area of the market that A, uh, is relatively unexplored um, and, uh, and is completely different from the marketing world. Um, so uh, it was a big bet. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll talk a bit about what we were excited about was how can we create a product for the first time, not for the first time, but a rare product that adds value and adds revenue, like directly to the bottom line of the, re of a real estate portfolio um, to make the sell so easy. Like, Hey, if we add this year, you will, you know, add, you know, 60% of free cash flow to your bottom line after, you know, all said and done. Um, parking is a, a huge portion of, uh, a portfolio of, of a lot of these multifamily assets. And we'll just talk about multifamily for now. Um, and we found through a lot of market research that it's not managed well um, and that they have sort of two options right now. They can go the route of handing over the keys to a large parking conglomerate or parking operator and they lose control of their tenant user experience, the lot, and they kind of relinquish control of everything and just get a flat check at the end of the month. Um, versus manage it on their own, but they don't have the tools at scale to do that properly. And so a lot of these other software solutions are very focused on units when um, parking spots um, are usually just like a side accessory to the lease and they're not treated like uh, individual assets that they are in our eyes. And so um, you'll, you'll look at these multi-billion dollar portfolios and they're managing parking with spreadsheets or hand-drawn maps at the individual site by site level. Uh, and then, you know, doubling, double clicking on that, you know, visitor parking assets specifically are off limits overnight because it's easier just to send a tow truck and say no cars allowed. Terrible tenant experience. Um, and so there's a lot of inefficiencies and, and extra labor associated to the mismanagement of parking as well. There's vacancy in, in parking spots. It's very hard for them to identify it, but there's lots of vacancy on a month to month basis or in certain areas across the United States where they, um, you know, they have certain, uh, uh, mandates for, uh, parking stall ratios for number of units, you know, 1.4 stalls for number of units when, you know, perhaps the building student living and nobody has a car cause they're just there walking to university or whatever. So, um, yeah, we got really obsessed with, uh, with trying to find a way to add an ancillary revenue stream and parking made the most sense. And what we actually did is we built a marketplace application that, and I hate referring it to Airbnb. I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but it's the easiest way to get the story across, but you know, the Airbnb of parking for property managers, essentially, 
Um, we take empty underutilized parking spots and can connect them on an open marketplace to external parking consumers that have been vetted for hourly, daily, and monthly uh, parking uh, and drive a whole new revenue stream. So that's sort of the start. There's quite a bit more, but yeah. Uh, if I can squeeze in here, Josh, I, um, I think it, it sounds like a great solution. I could see like when I was in LA or San Francisco or New York, how I would have wanted something like that. Right. However, um, it still doesn't connect immediately to me. I, I understand that how you're saying the buyer persona may be the same, but, um, what, uh, did you consider splitting it out as a separate company or like a subsidiary or, or, you know, why, why just merge the two together? Oh, you're saying the two business units that don't yeah. connect necessarily. Yeah, I mean, they, they really do operate as separate divisions and there's really just a number of us on the executive team that are on both sides. Um, so it really, it does operate as two companies consolidated to one reporting, but um, yeah, we've considered it. Uh, haven't had the need to yet. Uh, lots of efficiencies internally, um, but uh, yeah, potentially down the road we will. Yeah, I would just share. We had tried the same thing with our tech arm, Fiona. We were like, okay, maybe this should be a separate org, but at least we had a different name for it that felt very different from Digible. So even though on paper it's one org, it was easy enough to treat us two separate things. And there are times we're at trade shows where we have booths for both. So it's not, you know, uh, uh, we we still treat it that way, but it's caused some complications. Um, for us at, at times with like just the marketplace and even our staff about how they talk about things or what they talk about. So that's why I was curious. Yeah. Did you ever find you had like different cultures within both sides of the organization or would you say it's like cohesive? I think occasionally I, we've gone through some stretches where it maybe felt a little more like two cultures. Um, I mean, generally speaking, our engineers and our product folks are working on on that side but we've done a lot more integrating like between the two like the service and the tech and so yeah we we were very sensitive to that especially uh where we came from on in the media world between traditional media and digital media and so we've really tried to do our best to keep that from happening where there's kind of this dichotomy like under under one roof and I think we've been pretty effective at that. It also, there's a lot of energy that's created from the skill set and kind of the innovative ways that, you know, our technical side of the company is solving problems. And more and more, we're pointing that towards the service side, which is, I think, you know, becoming essential for us to stay competitive. Um, but this doesn't quite, uh, I don't know, it couldn't quite operate the way that we're describing it, or so it seems to me, mm -hmm. um, when you think about the digital assets versus, uh, you know, the parking mm -hmm. parking solution. Um, but I want to move, kind of move on, but uh, I am going to ask about cost models. So is this like auction based? I haven't gotten enough time like on the website, but you know, when you mentioned the Airbnb, that's not exactly how it's approached, you know, with their cost model, yeah. but to me, it's supply and demand if you're building up a marketplace. So could yeah. you talk to us a little bit more about how, how pricing works? Yeah. So we, we have some dynamic pricing models, but you need a certain install base of inventory for it to really be uh, effective. Um, and, uh, yeah, we try to enter markets, uh, with penetration pricing. Um, however, we do work collaboratively, collaboratively with the property manager to make sure that the pricing is worth their while. Um, and so, uh, usually that means 20 to 25% below market averages in the area. And then we're attracting that consumer that's willing to go a little bit of the extra mile to, you know, park on the back of this building or, you know, download an application um, pre-register their spot three weeks in advance, up to three weeks in advance and, um, you know, use technology to go in and out of, uh, gates and, uh, garages from, from our application. So, uh, it takes a bit of a bit of an innovative, uh, user. Yeah, totally. And, and is there a bit of a yield management or any form of that? And I, <laughs> it's a bit of a lightning rod right now in the industry when you talk about, um, revenue management, yield management, but I, uh, I'm just curious if you start to notice and you're one of these companies that does have that kind of inventory and they start regularly filling out these these vacancies, uh, they no longer have room. Why wouldn't you want to raise rates? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. And at the end of the day, like the property manager and their tenants have to come first before bringing anybody external in. So, sure. you know, always ensuring that our our. Um, you know, our database is synced up with their Yardi feed, for example, and we have some other integrations as well. And so we're always trying to make sure that we're two steps ahead of where the inventory is and making some predictions um, and then leaving some room for margin of error as well. 
Um, so you, you never want to fill your spots to 100% because there's going to be an issue, <laughs> a customer service call or something. I bet. So what is typical, if you don't mind sharing, and maybe you could just offer class A versus class B, if it's worth segmenting, but you said 1.4 stalls per per resident, I think I heard it on an average, but I'm just wondering how that translates then to what what's the typical vacancy or yeah. unoccupied stalls? Yeah, any- great question. Um, it, it really varies um, city by city um, and sometimes within city region by region. Um, and, and then there's some seasonality to it as well. Um, while a hundred percent of the units might be, uh, rented in the summer that's, and it's by a university, but the, the stalls are all empty. And so why not have, you know, the tenants relinquish their stalls and have some sort of rev share model to, you know, better utilize that asset. It's sort of a win, win, win all around for all parties. Um, and so, yeah, it really depends. Like we've seen, we've seen some, uh, come down to 0.8. Uh, you know, 0.8 stalls per unit. Um, it seems to be averaging between 1.2, 1.4, um, but it really, really depends on the region. And and if it's in a downtown core where there's you know, really solid public transit and and uh, depending on the demographic, we can see so, sometimes 60% of the building vacant. Um, but uh, on average, it could be, you know, 20, 30%. And it's, it's always fluctuating. It's always uh, the demands and supply is always changing. So. Yeah, super interesting. Um, if I can shift back and then I'll, I'll pass the baton back to David, but uh, JD, uh, um, on the uh, on the assets, like the digital creative, one of the other discussions David and I often have, and now we're hearing more coming from our, our customers, is just uh, questions about um, insourcing versus outsourcing. And a lot of times with marketing, it's, it's not all or nothing. It's, they just pick spots that they want to insource and outsource. But you mentioned that now with, with video and creative assets, even 3d, um, immersive, you know, experiences that there's more and more optionality, I'll say for these owners, um, to try and do some of this independently, uh, or I should say insourcing. So I'm just wondering where that trend sits right now for you guys or, uh, where you think it sits and how much you expect that to change over the next few years? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great question. And a lot of, a lot of the companies in our space are sort of offering this, there is a shift towards more of like a unit level uh, media, whether that be on a tour basis, a photo, a video floor plan basis, uh, compared to like the property level where you'll do one of each suite type. And a lot of that's driven by budgets. Um, from a vendor side, you know, most of our, players in the space are outsourcing most of this work overseas to Eastern Europe, to parts of Asia, whereas everything we do is all Central America. So no real issues from a time zone perspective. We're finding we're finding that our clients, typically, whether it's with marketing or, or um, additional maintenance people on staff, have the resources to try to take on more in-house, which obviously from our perspective, it means you need to have a tool set that is that provides options for both. So again, not looking too, too far under the hood here, but some of the stuff that we're working on is sort of utilizing existing technology that would allow on sites to capture their own media and not rely on partners with, you know, bulky cameras or old school sort of hardware to do it for them. Uh, and then taking that media, repurposing that media and using it across your campaigns, your websites, your individual units. So hopefully that kind of answers that. Uh, Reed. Yeah. Yeah. And one follow up. I don't know if you guys are already offering subscriptions on, on the, the digital side of things, but it seems like that's also where this is headed back to just kind of the macro trends. Um, so lots of opportunity up front, right? With a lease up or, you know, new construction and on some renos, but then, you know, how do you keep the, the, the revenue and the relationship going? So is that something you guys have already been doing for a while or, um, and how has that changed if at all, um, and what that subscription looks like? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. It's, uh, again, without giving away too, too much working on some opportunities to essentially convert everything from the render side all the way through to a real, um, you know, again, one, one unique experience for your clients, for your residents, and that's a consistent sort of brand media standard. So for us, we've, 
the biggest pain point I would say in the industry is the recurring fees associated with a lot of this type of media. So we're looking at trying to take tackle that issue head on and reducing that and opening up more budget. And yes, I'm going to steal this from Walmart, but we want our clients to do more with less. So if we can free up budget earlier on and that utilizes an additional suite of premium media, whereas we can take that from those and kind of uh, exorbitant um, hosting fees, that's our goal. We're, we're trying to free up some more budget. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'd heard similar things from other folks that competed at, at times in that report, uh, more about like you can compete on pricing, you can compete on service. And that <clears throat> actually sounds very similar to our story, uh, meaning we we provide white glove service, kind of like what you guys were talking about. And in the early days, we were seen as price competitive and we still are. I'm just more saying that's how we entered. And then we really kind of kept prices steady. So yeah, a lot of this connects with us. Um, but um, Josh, you had briefly mentioned the Matterport acquisition. So uh, I'm going to leave this more open, but I'm just curious what you guys think of that. Like, you know, what what's your take on it um, and how might that change things? Yeah. So, I mean, we started working with Matterport probably back in 2016, I would say. Um, and uh, I mean, the team back then looked very different than uh, you know, pre IPO, then post IPO, then post acquisition of CoStar. Um, we definitely lost a lot of like our initial uh, contacts um, a couple years into getting closer to that IPO, and the and the team structure had changed, and the, their priorities had changed, and they've done really well. Uh, they also made a really good product that that caught <laughs> um, really early on. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Like we love competition in the space because. You know, we have a partnership strategy. We want to work with a lot of different partners. Um, and I think it's healthy uh, to have competition. So, um, yeah, we'll have to see how uh, how the industry reacts and, and what CoStar does with, with Matterport, you know, as an asset vertically integrated into their, into their flow. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to watch. I know like a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, uh, property managers in the space are sort of waiting to see what the next move is and, and they're asking about it and, you know, what's next. Um, many of whom are working directly with CoStar in a few different facets. So, um, yeah. I, have you guys heard anything? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Uh, do you want me to go first? Or you sure. Go, first? go ahead. I, um, I thought it was interesting that they did it. I think it's interesting like that, um, um, that, Matterport is now, you know, almost getting pulled into being more specific to property management versus beyond. Um, that said, like when I've looked at the the other acquisitions, like not a lot changes. So it's kind of like, great, whatever was in market um, basically frees that in time. And that's what the next three years is going to look like. It's You're not going to see major product updates or you might see some pricing changes, but typically it's not dramatic. Um, a lot of times these acquisitions are for like customer base and um just to get the customer count up and then they're spending the next like 24 36 months trying to integrate all their systems and so even if they had integrations before now they're like i want it to be a native integration and so they're you know they're changing what's happening on the back end with the apis but the customers won't really notice that much of a difference so i don't think a lot's going to change as far as like cu for customers within the next two three years and uh, i'm not really sure how that might change in the future because again typically with these with these types of acquisitions you don't see a lot of innovation then start three years four years from now a lot of times it's like great what's the next acquisition we're going to make so it's not that you buy a product and try to evolve it you buy a product because it's got a half-life on it and then you kind of like you know milk that half-life that that's fine um so i don't think a lot is going to change there and, and, and in ways like almost kind of you didn't quite allude to this josh but i'll take it that way that um this may just help more like leave room for more competition because also a lot of, a lot of customers don't like to buy from, you know, the behemoths. And so they're like, shoot, now that you've been acquired, I want to find a, an alternative just because I don't know. That's just the, the, the way the customers like to like to buy. So that's my yeah. uh, two cents. But. Yeah. I think it's a home run uh, for CoStar. I think it's super smart move and I'll simplify this into kind of three categories one is revenue which is usually the driving factor usually um in in m a um they're now going to have this and not that they weren't already in some sort of partnership i don't know but you know in order to bundle right and especially when you're in a you know have such a foothold like costar you got to be really careful and thoughtful about product expansion where and how you're going to do it um 
And this just makes a ton of sense to me, whether you start with Matterport or whether, you know, you're starting with, with their, their legacy, I shouldn't call it legacy, but their directory um, and, and using that to bundle. So I just think it gives them some really nice versatility that should equal one plus one equals three or whatever. So I do see the multiplier, I guess, on the revenue side. And then there's the audience. So I think this in, I imagine, you know, they're excited about what this will mean as far as maintaining a good, fresh, you know, good experience, I guess, with, you know, um, loading up on the, the assets and then the content itself, which is connected to the assets. But one of the other opportunities, I think, for CoStar and Apartments.com more specifically is content. And, you know, they they have their listings and the basics, but, you know, in order for them to stay relevant and maintain the control that they have now, they need to keep investing in content. And in many ways, I just see it as a content company, not meaning like kind of outside of the property, but I think that's where we'll start to head as you'll see more and more videos and assets there, you know, giving a picture of the full community, not just what's happening at the property level. And so why not invest in a company that has the the tools, the technology, the infrastructure to bring that you know, to market. So I think those three, um, if they get it right, is going to be a huge, huge win, huge advantage for them. Yeah. If, if I can just add my two cents and maybe it's not even Matterport specific, but I'd love to get your thoughts too. A lot of what we're finding in the industry right now is historically companies, especially on the vendor side are kind of keeping their cards close to their chest. And we're finding more and more now that that's, that's kind of changing. It's opening up a little bit more towards this, what we're aspiring for is like a media um, ecosystem and companies that play well together. Again, it's driving value both on in threefold, it's driving value to the clients, it's driving value to the residents and it's driving value to the companies themselves. So for us, we see Matterport as you know one prong of the business. It's not a reliance, it's, it's one aspect for us that's obviously done well um, and will continue to do well because it is such a behemoth in the industry. But at the same time, it'd be a disservice to our clients if that's the only avenue we were focusing on. So making sure that we're basically covered from full end to end with platforms focused on the lease upside that's away from Matterport or focusing on the video more on the unit level too. There's a lot of avenues where it's it's always important for us to kind of maintain that relationship and our offerings with Matterport, uh, but to also make sure that we're providing options and tools to our clients that you don't have to rely on that, you know, one-stop shop or that behemoth, if you will. And Josh, what's been sentiment with customers? Oh, sorry, I, I should say JD. I was going to say JD since he was on the sales, uh, but I'm reading his name, which is Josh. I, I'm not I yet. I appreciate that. And Josh. I all the time. You <laughs> see, I'm, I'm trained now to just, if I hear Josh, it's like, Sit yeah. back. <laughs> what if you went by Josh too? How's that? Yeah. Josh, That's yeah. what I was going to say. I think you got to go J1, J2, J3. I, I was liking number two, Josh, but yeah. we can go with Josh. Too. Number, number, two, two is, number two has got too much. <laughs> or we'll just rename you to Logan. <laughs> Another option. Yeah. 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 Uh, sentiment with clients. You know, we've, we're at that time now with annual planning, it's budget season. And we always get asked about these types of questions. What's our hesitancy? What's our thoughts about this types of acquisition and the trends in the industry here? And, and it's really just that is we want to make sure that there are options and that people don't feel like they have to have a reliance because once you've invested too, too heavily and you find another option that might be better for a regional level and a building level or portfolio wide. Um, I think the, the biggest thing to me is, um, who controls the data and what you can do with that data. And I think that that's always been one of the hindrances of the Matterport platform is that the data provided to property managers is limited pretty much on like a vanity metric side, views, impressions, clicks, not as much, especially, you know, talk about a company like yours, data is everything. You need to be able to provide your clients with, you know, tangible insights about where the leads are coming from, um, what they're doing with the content. And that's always been sort of a, an area where they haven't excelled. So we're always like, trying to approach this from a different lens of how can we provide our clients with better data and use those insights to drive those decisions. So it sounds like cu customers are more asking you your opinion more than they are coming and saying, yay, nay, or whatever, however they feel about it. Yeah, I would say that's accurate. All right. Well, where do you want to go now? Well, Quickly back to the the parking. Um, 
What about the the kind of more ubiquitous parking apps out there? How much, Josh, do you see those as part of the competition? I don't know if, you know, the multifamily, like, you know, the properties are, uh, as David likes to say, wall garden, like meaning, or if that's what you're trying to establish. Um, but when I think about driving around downtown Denver looking for a parking space, you know, I'm taking my wife out for a date night. It doesn't even occur to me, and I don't know if those apps are including multifamily like lots mm -hmm. as an option, but it doesn't seem like it. I'll tell you that. I usually end up somewhere else. Um, but yeah, just curious if um, that's part of your competitive landscape or if that's al already been kind of uh, distinguished. Yeah, we see it as a huge opportunity for partnerships. Um, you know, we're not going to be the be all end all application, but we're trying to unlock this sort of alternative supply opportunity for all of these parking apps and for, and for ourselves. Um, yeah, parking apps, uh, as far as I know, like if a parking app is not doing operations, it's just doing, a, it's just doing, um, you know, marketing essentially and payment processing, which many of those applications are. And I would say one of the leading ones in the United States is, is definitely spot hero. Um, unbelievable user experience, uh, you know, great market share in some major cities, you know, spot hero doesn't necessarily, um, uh, they want clean inventory that they can market. And then they're super good at driving tons of demand to, they don't want to go into the niche of every single industry that they're playing with and, and solve their data problems, uh, to unlock each opportunity and, and segment. And, and, and so that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing the, we're doing the dirty work or, or some of the AI and uh, machine learning tech that we're building is doing the dirty work per se. It's removing, you know, parking stall audits and all the manual effort that's related to, um, keeping your parking data up to date manually, um, that, you know, any property managers listening on this call, you know, know what a parking audit is and how frequently they have to do it. And, you know, parking is one of those things right now that's on everybody's to-do list consistently. And we want to take it off the to-do list and automate all of those sort of basic tasks with um, AI and ML and uh, and then unlock an opportunity um, that uh, that wouldn't be worth the squeeze. The juice wouldn't be worth the squeeze if, if there was all the manual labor in, involved. So, um, yeah, no, I think uh, we love other parking apps. Uh, there's going to be some really cool opportunities down the road at scale with them. Um, but, uh, yeah, the main area that we're trying to do is the, is the, is the dirty work first. Yeah, totally. Well, it's, it's a less common use case, but I have to ask, I'm just curious, could do you ever imagine this hopping over to single family rentals or, or single family homeowners? Cause I think sometimes, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Austin and you have South by Southwest and it's a total shit show as yeah. far as trying to find parking, yeah. but you have all these suburbs that are kind of in and around the conference, uh, that would be, you know, prime, prime parking, um, real estate. Uh, so yeah, I just didn't know if, if you think that that day might, might come. Yeah. So funny you asked that. So we're, um, one of our close advisors, Tim Wooden, uh, he was the co-founder or founder actually of Rover, uh, which got acquired by spot hero. Um, and they built a peer to peer parking app. And so it was pure, like driveways off street, you know, on off street parking, um, and an application. Um, and, uh, we've had some really interesting conversations with him about, um, you know, his days of scaling the application. And, um, you know, he was hoping there'd be this, this network effect where neighbors would be telling each other, Hey, I'm making an extra 150 bucks a month while I'm at work. Uh, you should get on this platform. Exactly. Yeah. When in reality, they were um, actually quite competitive uh, with each other and didn't want to share because they had the parker on their land and they didn't want to get undercut. You could set your own rates. And um, and so, yeah, it was really interesting to watch him scale and then ultimately uh, get acquired. I think over COVID, um, they got acquired. Um, and uh, yeah, peer to peer is is a cool space. I think there's an opportunity for it in some cities, depending on the type of, of uh, homes. But, you know, for us even over condo, we're focused on multifamily because it's way more scalable. Uh, you could talk to one owner, uh, you know, like a gray star of the world with, with, you know, almost a million or 700 and 800,000 units, uh, and, and they can make a decision, uh, for, for that level of scale. When, if you go to individual condos, you're talking about, uh, a hundred, 200 units, and you probably have to work almost as hard to get through each individual board, <laughs> to agree on, on a, on a, you know, uh, 
on a board by board basis, condo by condo, and then going to the home by home level, the amount of effort and sales for, for one to two, uh, you know, driveway spots without that network effect and, um, you know, sort of natural growth, um, the economics don't make a ton of sense until it gets to scale. So, yeah, well, that's great context. Um, and speaking of, I guess, the gray stars of the world, but I'm going to get back to the trends that we're seeing, the macro trends in the industry. And one of that is one of those is definitely centralization. And so I'm just wondering how much the, I guess, the experience, the app itself lends to that um, or if that's kind of in development um, in the works. So you can't go to a conference these days and not hear about centralization. And obviously we know how third party and the ownership works within this industry. And in some cases, I think it makes it really easy to line up with with that big trend. Um, mm -hmm. But in some cases, depending on your product, it actually can be uh, an impediment. So how do you guys think about centralization and what you're building, how well that pairs up? Yeah, so I think integrations are really important. Uh, you know, to keep everything um, aligned. Like we don't want people to have to log into all of these different third-party apps and, and manage all of their data. Everything needs to be all connected to one, to one uh, system. Um, and uh, yeah, our system runs in the, back, in the background. Uh, you log in if there's an enforcement issue or something that you need to be notified about or to look at how much money you're making. Um, other than that, uh, we're just doing data parsing and cleaning your data, which we can write back to whatever centralized system that you're using um, or provide it in, in spreadsheet form. Um, so JDF have, sorry, let me ask more directly. So if you have a regional that has six or seven properties that they're overseeing, a regional property manager, then you have the property manager. Are, who's, who's managing this? Yeah, so we have... Uh, oh, I understand what you're asking. So, so we have different account levels um, with different different permission sets. So, yeah, one individual could manage it for the entire portfolio okay. once yeah. all the data is cleaned up. Um, yeah. Or uh, you could have sub sub tasks. Like sometimes on the on the caretaker level or on site level, um, we give them permission to you know view only data and do enforcement runs with the enforcement application but not actually make changes. So it's sort of a view and need only basis while all the decisions can just be made to implement with one person uh, at the top of the chain. Cool. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but did you say the resident does get a piece of the, the, the revenue or is it just the, the property? At the moment and for scale, we're just focused on empty and underutilized stalls, but yeah, there will be an opportunity and we have tested it for uh, residents to relinquish their spot while they're on a road trip for two months or something like that as well. Cool. Yeah. It kind of backs us up to that single family, I guess, just, you know, how much do you kind of open things up? But then it, I was getting there partly for you, JD, but just, you know, how much you see this as something that's marketable. So when you're selling those assets, and I don't know that it would actually be under your domain anyways, but just um, for Digible, for example, like how much of uh, a differentiator is this for a property? But until there's some money going in the resident's pocket, I mean, it's still probably something you'd want to promote, I guess, on the website. But I'm just wondering how you guys are approaching the marketing strategy. Yeah, you know, we Josh kind of mentioned before, we find we try to find some synergies between both divisions operating under like Great Galactic, if you will. Uh, and then at the same part, there's two distinct teams operating or independently. So in terms of like synergies, before you get to the marketplace component where we're opening up spots to the public, the, the Airbnb model, kind of understanding how the lot works first and foremost, that, you know, the management side. Uh, same application for us creating parking maps as it is for site plans and site maps to be used for floor plan navigators and unit level content. So from a marketing standpoint, you you basically just expanded the product line to say we have tools that that go beyond just from a marketing standpoint but also a leasing standpoint so that's where we typically like to approach this we can drive value from an operation standpoint leasing standpoint and uh marketing standpoint cool yeah. well uh before we uh well actually i want to back up i want one clarifying question when you guys have talked about using ml and ai for the parking uh, side of things how does that work? Do you guys have, is there certain tech beyond their, their data that you're pulling in uh, that's required or, or not? Yeah. Um, yes, there is, um, 
in, in, we're basically trying to take, you know, 30 to 40 different data points and, and run it through a model to get a 99.9% .9 accurate depiction of what the law looks like live. Um, whether we're pulling data from live uh, hardware, such as uh, license plate recognition, like LPR scanners, um, or um, some AI tools to count how many stalls are in a lot to line up with our enforcement data, um, or even just manual inputs from whether it's the property manager, leasing staff, um, enforcement data. So we're pulling from every angle and doing essentially, you can think of it as what a property manager would do if they had time uh, to manage their parking at this level, um, but just doing it all at once and every, you know, uh, rapidly every single day, <laughs> essentially. Um, so um, yeah, taking lots of, ba it's a lot of basic information. Um, it's it's really not complicated. It's just if, if it, it takes a human so long to, um, do all the data parsing on their own manually that it's not worth the squeeze at all. Um, it's, it's not worth it. And that's why it's just always on the to-do list on almost every property manager's uh, list. Got it. So you guys aren't like uh, requiring or sending certain hardware. You're kind of using what they have already, but there's enough sort of like signals that when you combine them, you can get a really informative model. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. That, that, that would be helpful from a scale perspective. Um, so cool. Well, before we started, read sort of T or I don't know, let you guys know that we often towards the end like to ask about hot takes. So um, if you guys aren't familiar, but hot take is just where you might be contrarian in the way you think, or other people think you're crazy for thinking what you're thinking. So, uh, but wanted to wanted to see what you guys have, like what what hot takes come to mind. So um, I don't know who wants to go first here. I got I got uh, one one or two here that I can I can start with. Okay, cool. Um, to me, I, I think the the landscape will change pretty significantly from a lead gen standpoint and also a capture standpoint. So, starting on the capture side, I think we're already seeing the shift away from bulky hardware. Those big three D cameras that you're seeing being used, I think we're we're now getting to a place where Hardware like our cell phones is going to be enough to capture everything that you need all at the same time, whether it be photos, tours, video, et cetera. Um, thus kind of eliminating the need for external parties to do all most of the capture. Uh, and then on the lead gen side, I think everything that we're seeing points towards um, social media being the biggest driver of quality leads away from um, you know, ILS listings, I really think that the content that we're being seen is enough to, to drive and to warrant more of a budget, um, going forward for, for a fully sell. Both good ones. Reed, either of those two, do you want to dive into? I was going to take the second one, but do you, okay. you want to cool. take, well, we had, a um, a guest on God, what was her name? Bethany or Brittany? I don't know. It was a few months ago with student housing. And it wasn't a surprise to me to hear her say something similar, just as far as the lead gen and social, like kind of overtaking the ILSs. And that's been more that, that uh, I guess, that trend, if you will, has, has been forming for several years in, in that subset of rental. Um, so I'm wondering, JD, when you say that, if you're anticipating or believing that social is, is going, is now starting to um, become one of the lead. Uh, not one of, it sounds like you're saying the kind of leading um, generator uh, or platform for Generation X. Um, God, what am I trying to get out here? I'm just saying like outside of millennials, you know, because yeah. usually when I hear that, that forecast with social, it's like with the caveat or asterisk, you know, for people that are 25 and under or something or 30 and under. So are you suggesting that you think within the next few years that will become the predominant like um, lead generation platform across the board? Yeah, so I, I was picking up what you were throwing down. Don't worry about that. Thank you. Uh, I think that you've, <laughs> you've, you've nailed it. And what I meant by this is the way that the industry is moving with geofencing capabilities, with hyper-targeted um, content used on social, it's enough to generate interest months and months before a lease up is ready. So put another way, 
let's say we've got a new building that shovels just hit the ground 12 months out, 18 months out, six months out, you could have a full content strategy of, let's say, rendered video from us that's passed to your team to roll out for your clients, uh, social media campaigns, your website campaigns. But that right there, that type of content will be enough to effectively lease up an entire building months before completion. That's, yeah, that's my spicy hot take. Cool. Did you want to unpack well, that a little the, further too? Or the did... first one, I guess, like since we on the hardware, one, yeah, the hardware. Why is it not there today, Josh? Like I, I kind of thought the hardware was there. It was just more about workflow and people adopting it. But is is that true, or is there some something else that that just needs we need to get over the hump on? I think uh, I think it follows like the product adoption necessarily follows like the marketing one hundred and one of that bell curve. And nobody wants to really be that first mover. And until we've found someone who's going to bring this on and, and really roll this out, um, everyone wants to be the second person to bring on new tech, not the first. Um, so we're testing out a couple of different platforms here that'll make this a one-stop shop. Uh, and again, don't want to get into too, too much details now, but the technology within our phones, LiDAR, for example, it's, it is amazing. And I believe that's the future. Okay. Uh, subtle flex, though, because that means you have to have an iPhone, right? I Talk actually believe iPhone. it was. <laughs> yeah, I think Android rolled it out yeah. first. So, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. This just in. Grid has inked a deal with <laughs> yeah. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but we just happens. can't support green text messages here. We're, we're Team Blue. So. Oh, got it. Got it. All right, Joshua, what about you? What, what hot takes you have? <sighs> Yeah, well, I'm sort of between two, like, one of our, like, earlier investments and in products that we rolled out was uh, was sort of a, a VR search platform. Another company emerged out of New York. I'm not sure what they're up to now. I haven't followed them, but we we launched it. And, and uh, you know, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't pick up uh, as we had planned. I think we were extremely early on the VR trend. Um, and uh, yeah, there you go. That's our old logo. The 1.0s. One, the, 1 <laughs> uh, the two point oh's. <laughs> So I'm still trying to think, like I, I had the fortune of trying uh, Apple Vision Pro um, two weeks ago. Um, and I'm trying to decipher if it's like one of those cool things you buy to show your friends or is somebody actually going to use this like on a day to day, you know, every single basis. And after trying it, I thought it was super cool and I would like play around in it, but I wouldn't work in it for eight hours. Um, that being said, we were at a Google event in Vegas earlier this year. I met a, a founder out of Silicon Valley that works in it uh, nine to five every single day. Um, and, uh, you know, uses two monitors in there and like he does his coding in the Apple Vision Pro. So, yeah, if we have to make like a big bet... I, I don't know if VR is going to pick up in the way that the, the industry wants it to pick up in right now. <laughs> um, and I used to be a huge proponent for VR and like, I still like it. I have a headset over here. Um, but uh, in the, the, you know, in the next few years, I think it has to come a long way before it's like, you know, maybe in five plus years, but, but uh, yeah. Well, and what I have to ask a follow up to that. What do you think is, kept it from picking up pace is it more the awkwardness the clunkiness like meaning the the actual experience physical experience um or do you think it's the price or a combination yeah. of both or am i missing a, a third reason i i think you're hitting yeah you're hitting a bunch of nails on the head like like the cost is 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 pretty wild like it's out of reach for many users right now um quality like you know we had an oculus go uh, a while ago at the office we've tried some of the previous Oculus headsets the quality is getting there like it's pretty sweet uh, i was really impressed with some of the things the vision pro could do but like at the price point um i'm not going to replace my computer with it for sure um so yeah i i think uh i'm not necessarily a full vr expert just kind of follow the industry and um yeah i don't know what do you guys think Oh, well, this time you can go first. Then. No, no, no. I know this is more your your, <laughs> your area of expertise. Uh, you you've done a little more research. Plus, you you got a uh, Oculus a while. Before. Yeah. Well, I think they're super cool. Like you said, Josh. I think uh, I think VR is an is an interesting toy at the moment, but it's it's challenging for me to as as cool as it is to want to use it all the time, right? Like 
um, I already feel like Zoom is claustrophobic enough. And it's not like if I were to do Zoom inside of my headset, do I feel less claustrophobic, even though it's like, oh, you could put whatever surrounding you want around it. It's like, okay, sure. But I'm still like looking at a Zoom screen. Um, so um, that's challenging. So let me jump to what I think it's going to take. I think it's going to take AR uh, before. It, I think that's going to take off first before VR, which mm -hmm. to me is super interesting that the industry went so VR heavy first. And maybe it's because of the sizzle of VR versus if they had just gone AR. So if you would have had like Google Glass that like just kept at it for longer, or other competitors to Google Glass, if they would have popped up, I think that would have been more useful. So if I could like read a text message without having to look at my watch or my phone or like, um, I don't know, be able to like now with like the large language models, if I could very quickly get information on something, that would be way more useful to me and still feel more respectful. So one of the problems that I don't like about like the Apple watch or your phone is like, Hey, hey, hey David, <laughs> I saw you. I just got this. This yes, is an upgrade. Yeah. I saw Yeah, no, you have a bigger battery. Um, my, like, even when I was looking up your guys' website, like as we were, um, as we were chatting here to, to get some uh, deeper information to see if I needed to ask, ask a certain question, I felt that I was being disrespectful to you because I put my eyes down real quick to look at the screen versus looking at you in the eye. And so if you had like an AR glasses where I could quickly see the grid thing or whatever on the side, I don't feel like I'm being disrespectful to you and I can still get the quick info that I need. So I think that's the leap it's going to take. And what's, it's just interesting to me because I don't think the technology is, I think we could do it if we just spent our billions there versus on, you know, these, these headsets. So I just don't see the headsets taking off until, uh, until AR is almost like the, um, yeah, well, the lead in, I guess, to going full mm -hmm. VR at the point. Mm -hmm. I, I have to add on to that. I'm going to go a step further and, um, and say until they build something that allows you to actually have, uh, visibility both into, you know, the virtual reality, but then also can still see, and maybe this exists and I'm just, I, I don't, I don't realize it, but it doesn't seem that way that it is fully immersive. And where I'm going with this is you're fighting like several years of evolution, right? It's like humans. I mean, that's biology. It's innate. It's like, it's, you know, we're survivors, right? <laughs> so you want to always be ha able to see around you, meaning what's going on? Am I in danger? You know, because it creates anxiety for me as David uses claustrophobic, you know, with, with Zoom and stuff. But the idea of being completely locked into a different reality that I can't see, touch, feel mm -hmm. what's around me makes me nervous. And it's like, and I think that's deep, deep, deep rooted in our in our human brains and so that's a lot that's not like you know just trying to overcome you know a, a certain habit or change a behavior the way a lot of products do this this you're now fighting almost survival instincts and i may be getting a little bit you know whatever over the top but i that's what i feel when i've played with these things i'm like the fact i cannot see anything other than what's in front of my eyes like meeting within that virtual reality makes makes me uncomfortable mm -hmm. Have uh, have either of you been to the Sphere yet in Vegas? Yeah, yeah, we went together. Uh, saw it. It was uh, a beautiful date night. He brought me roses and amazing. Yeah, look at my door. Yeah, amazing. You look very um, handsome that night. Yeah. So beyond beyond how handsome I'm sure you looked, to me <laughs> that experience as a whole is I think I think the Sphere is like the greatest technological advancement in an entertainment setting that we've ever seen. But if you apply that to like the full immersion, take out the motion sickness, because I get rocked by that. Like that's how I see it. The the VR, it's it's almost too immersive to the point where you've got like a, a ready player one sort of scenario. And we, you know, the younger generations are already glued to their phones enough. We don't need them glued to a headset. I, I kind of agree with David here. The the kind of walk before you run the AR application about just augmenting that, applying that to the real world, that kind of halfway point. I think that's kind of the way of the future too. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of crave that honestly. Like I, I remember when like AirPods first came out um, and people were like, Oh, this will be great AR experience because the AirPods can give you like little notifications based on, you know, where you're at, what meetings coming up, whatever. I just haven't experienced that yet. And I'm, I'm sort of craving that whether these large language, mo language models be, are the unlocked to that or not. But, um, yeah, I would definitely like to still remain present, which is kind of to Reed's point. I don't want like all my vision taken up, but there's like little bits of information that I would find useful if I had a device giving it to me. 
Um, so Josh, I'm going to, I'm going to guess you had said in the very beginning of our conversation that you had some fails, uh, and some successes. Uh, would you say this, it, does it, does VR touch on that thread? Is it one of those things that you, that didn't go as well as you had hoped? For sure. Yeah. We were, we were just, you know, too early on the curve. I mean, the idea, um, I mean, back in 2017, 2018, we launched a website and then along with the website was this like immersive apartment search platform, which essentially would um, allow you to put on a VR headset and navigate th on a map in the city into different apartments and walk through them. Um, and at the time we were pushing our clients uh, to, uh, and shooting them for free a lot of the time, uh, but getting our clients to shoot uh, their lobbies, amenity spaces, and then a few different unit types just to allow them to really walk through the entire building um, and qualify themselves before they actually come in person. Uh, the hardware that we were using wasn't there. We weren't going to go in and compete with Oculus for sure, although we should have. It was a profitable venture for them. Um, and, Is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead, sorry. No, but yeah, you know, I, I, I still think about that and those times and like, I think that'd be really cool. Um, but would I, do I have a headset at home? Most people don't. And, you know, would I go in, download an application to do that, to, to use it once a year um, while searching for an apartment, if that, you know, if I'm an apartment, uh, if I flip apartments every year, which some don't. So yeah, that, you know, that was, that was an interesting learning experience for us. Probably our first, uh, our first flop, I would say. Um, cool. But we took it on the chin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Reed and I have talked about this a lot. He's talked a lot about changing the way that apartment search happens. Um, but Reed's been more stuck with voice, like um, more than the VR aspect. Uh, so, do you want to give him any of that background or what you think? Just an AI like apartment broker. So, and it makes the most sense to me if Amazon's ever going to get into this industry because they've gotten obviously into quite a few now um, that they would bring something like this to market where. It would learn you, it would interview you just the way a broker would, right? Um, get all the information. Ideally, they also have the the, the kiosk or the display um, so that you still get some visual and they would just start sharing different apartment, you know, solutions for you, but super hyper custom, um, but really mostly driven by voice versus, um, you know, something virtual or whatever. But that could be a nice add on to it potentially. But it just seems strange to me that it doesn't exist. And what I've told David, you know, is the experience, the reason it's so flawed still in my opinion is there's nothing agnostic like all these ai leasing agents are trying to pitch that property not even it's starting to happen and we've had some podcasts uh, with some of the you know some of the household names if you will with uh chatbots and multifamily and they're they're starting to offer more um like i guess pmc or sister property like functionality uh because a lot of times when you hit one of those bots and it's like no we don't have any more studios available it's like, well, I'm on to the next property. But if you really had a great experience, and again, think Alexa, you know, or whatever, uh, Google, uh, they would say, don't worry, you know, here's two or three others um, that would make a lot of sense. So, yeah, I think, uh, and Reed started talking about this before the large language models came out. So it seemed more far fetched because, you know, the other um, agents are more like true false kind of based. And so the amount of like, sort of layers you'd have to have is, is a lot the program but now with the large language models i could see this being like easier to pull off and frankly you could probably do it with them today in your own way just my experience trying to shop with them currently is they're still kind of lacking a bit and sometimes they forget like hey we already talked about this i already told you i wanted this thing and now you're just conveniently forgetting that i wanted this thing <laughs> and uh as it gives me a sort of like search results yeah. um so i think it's getting closer and i, and I totally think it's going to end up happening yeah, my my only thought on on the the chatbot is for a decision to me like renting a new space, buying a car, buying a house. As soon as I have any sort of inkling that I'm connected to a bot, I'm typing agent, and I still need that human experience as much as possible. Um, we've actually explored with the AI voiceover from a video standpoint, where historically we would hire voice actors to do all of our high quality videography. And now we're actually based off of language models, able to recreate that just using, you can say, I want, you know, Joe from Australia to do the voiceover now. And it's, it's getting much pretty on pretty much a par. So that's, that's a pretty unique kind of use case too. Yeah, totally. All right, cool. Well, before we let you guys out of here, is there anything that we missed that you want to make sure you get in? Um, so we'll give you that guys the floor and otherwise we'll move on. What do you think, Josh? 
no, I think I think it was a really good chat. Yeah, I appreciate the time and the invite. Um, we'll come on any time. And we'd oh, love absolutely. to meet in person one of these days as well. Well, you'll see us around. Uh, so if guys, if folks want to learn more about you and Grid, what's the best way? How should we direct them? Uh, well, so our site, grid.com, that's grid with a Y. Um, should point you to both directions, whatever you're interested in chatting. And uh, Josh Doan and I are always happy to take uh, take one-on-one -on -one meetings and chat further. Yeah, we're especially happy to travel to hot locations for meetings whenever we need to. Um, so we're, we're more than happy to, to make that work for, for travel too. Can I take that literally, like you guys enjoy warmer climates or do you just mean like really cool markets like Denver? Uh, first of all, Denver is one of the hottest up and coming markets. So we're, we're more than happy to make our, our trek down to Denver, especially in the winter for ski season. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, to be honest, a lot of us, uh, we operate through LinkedIn is a great kind of medium to connect. Happy to grab coffee and chat virtually in person, the whole, the whole spiel. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you too. We appreciate you coming on, Josh and JD. Thank you. Yeah.